So hi, uh, I tried to find the picture which is fine <coughs> to the environment, but I don't know if it's summer in Amsterdam. <laughs> it's summer, right? Okay. <laughs> so uh, my name is uh, yeah. Okay, my name is Mete, and uh, I work in a company called Forcing Insights. It's in the social media advertisement and TV broadcast monitoring business and I am a developer for the last 13 years and uh, I expertise on .NET and SharePoint solutions. Uh, by the way, uh, at first I want to mention uh, this, is, uh, this session is uh, not about like, teaching something to you but it's more of like sharing some experiences and most of those experiences are like hardly successes and actually they are failures. So uh, I appreciate if you can also share your experiences with me or you can ask questions. For encouraging you, I brought some beers. <laughs> and in case you don't like beers, or who doesn't like beer, but yeah, uh, there are chocolates. <laughs> so yeah, I can afford as a total of eight questions or oh, nice. participations. But yeah, if, if we are out of time, then I owe you a beer. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I have a website which is called codingmic.com and it has all the information about me, like uh, social media things. I hope it's still open because I'm kind of a lazy guy and uh, it's pretty usual for me that domains expire or hosting expires, etc. I'm making this presentation for the third time, but this page frequently changes, I can assure you. <laughs> so the uh, subject is over engineering, and it's a monster, as I thought, but it's a very uh, cute monster, and it's somewhere it should be hidden behind the rack. Uh, why uh, I call it as hidden? Uh, because in my experience, most of the time we don't address the issues that we have as like, ah, oh, okay, this was due to our engineering or so. We usually blame other things. But in my experience, this is also a major factor which leads uh, projects to failure. Sometimes, in fact, uh, as far as I know, there are some statistics about uh, failures in projects. It says some projects seem to be successful, but in fact they are failures because you deliver a system to the uh, customer and then sometimes or maybe usually, I don't know, they don't use the system as expected. And then, yeah, you get the money, your company still uh, gets the money and uh, it's a success on paper, but in fact it's a failure. So, uh, the. Uh, stories that I will share are uh, about my previous experience in Turkey. I'm living for the last one year here, here in Eindhoven, but uh, they refer to my past project. And it will be very interesting if uh, to see uh, where those experiences match with your experiences in here. So uh, instead of putting a wiki article in here. Uh, let's say, what is over engineering? Let's say this is your kid and he wants a bike from you. And in my experience in Netherlands, I saw babies with diapers which are riding uh, two-wheel bikes. But uh, yeah, okay, let's say he, he actually needs a three-wheel bike. But what we try to deliver to him uh, in accordance to this request is something like that. I say we try to because we, we, we can't deliver this because we are limited by budget, we are limited by skills, and uh, if we even try to deliver this, then this should be something like a, well, with, with one wheel or maybe without an engine or something without an exhaust or something like that. In fact, I tried to uh, depict it and uh, I hope it still looks like a motor uh, So usually this is the case that we deliver to the kid. And 
what happens in this case is he is uh, disappointed and frustrated because we promised him a motorbike, but he didn't. Uh, and it, it would be very funny if he could uh, run a motorbike. Uh, but yes, he will still be disappointed. We will do our best to deliver something like that. And then we will deliver something, but he won't be happy at all. So in my experience, this is the scale of our engineering, how it happens in life. So if we do our engineering in the analysis of the system, then yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. So if, when you move to this side, the effect is lower. But this is where uh, we promise to deliver a motorbike to our kid. OK, then whatever we do, he will be disappointed. So this is kind of where, uh, let's say, we deliver an e-bike to him. Not a motorbike, but an e-bike. Uh, if it happens in the development phase, OK, it's not that harmful. I can say this is where we deliver him a three-wheel bike, but with a GPS locator on it. OK, <laughs> it still won't fit. He, he can still be able to ride it. But it will be uh, not necessarily very expensive. So we can start with my first story. And uh, I think most of the developers are uh, friendly with this. Uh, you try to develop a software solution, and it's always compared with EXA by the users. They, they say, uh, I, I was able to do this in Excel, and I was uh, able to do formulas, I, uh, and I, had, I was able to do, uh, get those reports in Excel, but not in your system, blah, 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 blah. And your system is uh, sometimes always compared with Excel, and you, you feel like you are competing with Microsoft <laughs> in your field. Uh, so this is the project that we were doing in year 2009 to a government organization in Turkey. And I very professionally obfuscated the data. And th this was from an actual Excel page. Uh, to give you some context about the company that I worked for, uh, it was the uh, most major, biggest uh, systems integration company once. And then uh, it got so many uh, contracts that I think the enterprise b behind the company was a little scared, so they decided to sell it to someone. And then the CEO appeared, uh, I want to buy it, but he didn't have any money, so he got credits, etc. So he was, the company was in some kind of uh, financial trouble, but it had still a lot of contracts to deliver. And in that time, we, we were trying to deliver this project. So this is an Excel sheet. And uh, this Excel sheet was used for uh, in the field of farming. So there were some interviewers in the organization which go to farms and fill in such uh, forms. And uh, each Excel file contained like 12 or 13 sheets like that. And uh, for each farm, they fill in those forms. So in order to make this more uh, not abstract, <laughs> uh, you can think of like, let's say these are the uh, calves, uh, depending on their ages, numbers, or the uh, things that they eat, or the products that they produce, etc., etc. And there are many pages like that about like, uh, the production of the farm. It can be uh, agriculture uh, products or animals or anything. So the purpose of the project is simply fill in some Excel forms, then transfer data to the database, and then get some results and get some stati statistics out of the system for making some decisions. And in fact, there was such a system in Netherlands, and this organization was uh, Oh, they, they needed to have a similar system. But the issue was, this shouldn't be so easy, right? It should be harder. So they should be very innovative. <laughs> and what they came up with is, 
doing Excel web page, then it would be very innovative. And that the the time was 2009, and there was no online Excel editing thing. Yeah, it was just uh, possible to view Excel sheets online, but you couldn't edit it, and you had to develop this solution yourself. And another issue is uh, if you if you can even do that. You can uh, edit Excel or online. Then you come up with another issue, which is uh, the interviewers go to farms, which is in the middle of nowhere, and there's no internet connection. And yeah, in the in the uh, context of those years, and uh, so ah sorry. So you have to print the. Excel files which were edited online, then the interviewer should go to the farms and then fill those papers and then the software should scan and recognize the handwriting of the person and uh, insert the fields to the DB without any issue or with issues, but it should have the capability to learn from the mistakes. <laughs> with your, <laughs> uh, while you're correcting it, and uh, since this is a, not a uh, paper designed for filling uh, and scanning, it, it was basically a table, and it was it's really also another challenge to recognize the fields. Okay, this cell belongs to this, and you have to match this. This is another issue. Then. The only meaningful thing is the business intelligence, and it was also uh, uh, a trend those years. Hey, business intelligence, there, there was no big data, but there's business intelligence. So, yeah, okay, this is, I think, it still stands. Okay, this is, this is still good, I think. So what happened is, we tried to do this online, but, uh, Okay, there was also bad design in the project. Let's say this was an ASP.NET page. Uh, I'm completely innocent, so I came after the design of the project. Oh, I'm always innocent. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what the initial designers made was all of these fields were text boxes, and they were using the internal AJAX uh, technology of ASP.NET, so they were writing server-side code and it was translated to JavaScript and uh, how they did formulas running was uh, they created for each cell, they created an in-memory compiler uh, <laughs> so, so I think they tested it with like eight cells of data, but with this table it took like, I don't know, 15 minutes to load <laughs> Then, yeah, okay, so th these, were, these were the smallest challenges that we had. Okay, we, we solved this, we optimized, etc., etc., but still, when we delivered it to the users, they came up with questions. Ah, in exile, I can navigate with arrows, but not in your solution. Okay, let's add it. In exile, I have like cross sheet formulas, and I should have them. Ah, okay, in exile, I have validations, but you don't have. And in Excel, I have named ranges, but you don't have, and the, the, it's just space is the limit for that. And they just kept on coming and coming and coming. It was like uh, it would uh, never end. But okay, we still delivered it to the customer, but the result was they never used it. So the company get the money, but in fact, at the end, the company bankrupted. <laughs> Not because of this project, but they had many projects like that, and. Their plan was, okay, let's get this project, and it doesn't matter if we uh, don't win any money from it, then we will start profiting uh, from the maintenance, and yeah, they, it was a huge bankrupt. And uh, so this table is uh, what I made. We kind of spent 70% of the effort to doing the web-based exam, and to be honest, it also felt cool to me, okay, I would write, I, I develop web-based exam to my CV and the employees will, will see it and uh, will be very impressed when seeing it. Yeah, in reality, it never happened. 
and scanning or for the sake of the effort spent, I, I put 5% of the value and for this web page the exam zero because it's not used. It's uh, they just tried and then gave up. And business intelligence had the real value. So uh, the takeaway of this uh, story is these are my lessons learned. Uh, it's good to negotiate the requirements. Yeah, okay. You can have some requirements or specifications about the tandem which smell or feel like over engineering and you can feel like I want to do that. I want to be the first person who ever did that and I want to write it on my CV. But uh, in fact, it's a good idea to negotiate because when you start such a thing, you can feel like, ah, will, will the customer think that we are not capable of doing this, etc., etc., ah, maybe we should act like we will do it, etc. But uh, they are normal people and they, want, they just want their project to be successful. And they, they don't want uh, the projects to fail as you are. And uh, also because they, they are reporting to their superiors, etc. So I tried it in some later projects. Okay, I can't say that they were uh, that perfect, but I tried this and it actually worked. But this, the first item, depends on uh, your media with the customer. You can be in direct touch with the customer, depending on your organization. Or you can be a developer and you can be communicating over a project manager or product owner or something else. But the thing is, you can initiate things. You can tell the person that you are responsible to, hey, we, what are we doing this for? There is an alternative to this and it's, it, it works like that without, anything, without doing anything else. And it works. And this thing requires I know, one year of development. So why do we do that? And they are, if, if they are intelligent people enough, they will understand and they can negotiate it. So the second thing is focus less on CV. Uh, really, I didn't have any effect on having such a thing on my CV. I even didn't write uh, such thing on my CV. I did uh, that based exam, etc. And uh, today it doesn't seem any cool to me. <laughs> and uh, while you're preparing for a tender, what happens is uh, usually in your company there are people like salespeople or uh, pre sales people, project leads, or such people which are not originally engineers. Uh, so they look at the uh, specifications and they, at some point they come to you and ask. Uh, the, there are such specifications and are they possible? And the default answer is yes. But everything is possible, come on. Uh, but if you add yes, but this is so hard and this takes so much time and this will be over engineering and it's very risky, etc. Maybe they can uh, negotiate it with the customer from the beginning and then you will have more chance to deliver the project. Okay. Okay. In my experience, the product manager just stops listening after the word yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it usually happens. But yeah, probably you should do the extra step like, but, <laughs> and yeah, maybe you can. Uh, which which beer would you like? Or Ooh, can I? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is which one? I don't know, you can choose. Oh, oh, oh. Unfortunately, they are not cool, but yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. So uh, this is the second project that I kind of crashed. <laughs> okay, kind of a failure story. Uh, after bankrupting this company, I had a new uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had a new target. And I found this company and I said, oh, okay, this is ideal for me. <laughs> So uh, this was a SharePoint project, a content management system running on SharePoint. And this was also, I was an outsourced employee working on the, uh, this other government organization. And uh, they were 
basically renewing their content management platform. But this content man management platform is uh, something like it doesn't only contain their uh, website, it contains all the units that belong to this organization. Let's say a uh, website of a city, website of a uh, village, or website of a town. And they provide such a uh, SaaS solution to the customers or their customers are their, their units and they say okay you can just come to our platform and host your websites and de design the wizard and then we can host it here so it had like hundreds of websites and this was kind of their previous solution and I was surprised when I saw it because it really seemed something like that and the page title description select theme and there were some few more pages and enter announcement and uh, select team and it, it was like a few pages which consist of, of such a thing and there was no such thing as branding etc in <laughs> main on the management pages so but the thing is this was very basic very simple but in fact it was very easy to use and I heard stories of People who are managing this platform, uh, they, they are uh, managing their site, creating site and updating content in like villages, towns, even uh, some people like uh, teachers of the school or police officers doing this thing for the website. But they came up with, oh, okay, we have some bigger uh, units, so we need something complex and probably they went to a conference or something like that and they sell so SharePoint and it, well, it seems so cool and it always seems so cool in the uh, conferences or announcements Microsoft events and everything is so easy and drag and drop and yeah it seems they were impressed and they said okay we need something more complex and this seems to be very flexible and we can use it but what we ended up was they said, ah, this is too complex, so what can we do? Then they came up with this brilliant idea. But it happened before me, I completely didn't. <laughs> uh, they tried to turn this into this. So they were practically downgrading SharePoint to seem like a custom ASP.NET application. And <laughs> it, was, it was really hard. And, Funny, but uh, <laughs> at that time you, you didn't think so. And at some point, I came up with the, I prepared a presentation to them because they were asking questions. Ah, oh, why, why are, aren't you delivering this? Why is is it taking so long? It's just easy. You have to downgrade this to this. And I show this to them. These are the, uh, let's say, the content management area. Uh, these are the main features that SharePoint provides and sites, authentication, search and web parts. Web parts are if you don't know like something like uh, reusable uh, user uh, controls which you can drag in any uh, uh, place in the page. Uh, we customize all of that to look like something <laughs> it's not. Uh, it to, we, we tried to turn SharePoint into a non-SharePoint environment and it was a, yeah, I, I think most of the projects in SharePoint end up something like that. And we just used the list structure for just using the data, like a database, and we just used the page structure of SharePoint for hosting web parts, which doesn't have any point. And I showed this to them and I described for one and a half hour, etc. And then the response was, why didn't you say that SharePoint is such a uh, problem system before? So th they, they just blamed SharePoint, but not, not, the, not the idea of creating something from the out-of-the-box solution. So uh, the result was the company that didn't bankrupt because it in, in fact, it was for their own benefit because they were renting us to the organization. So uh, it, uh, 
it was better the more the uh, the longer the project lasted for them, uh, and it was a government organization. They don't care how much money they pay. Uh, so the first lesson could be keep it simple, stupid. But uh, the thing about this is, I see this everywhere. Like in my in my previous company, it was it's a kiss, 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 kiss. But in fact, in reality, I didn't see people keeping keeping things simple. Yeah, we just keep mentioning this, but we don't do this. Even I mentioned this in my latest job interview. They said, "What is your philosophy?" And I said, "Keep it simple, stupid." And they were so impressed. Ah, yeah, but <laughs> still, <laughs> still, we are trying to overcomplicate things. So this is why I call over engineering as a monster and a cute monster. It's a monster that we kind of create. And uh, to be honest, also in this project, I was thinking like ah, I will be doing I will be creating a wizard to create other web applications and websites in SharePoint and it will be so cool on my CV. So yeah it never worked. And we should ask the question to ourselves why are we using an out of the box solution? Yeah. So if you have such custom requirements uh, which doesn't match with the features of this product, then why are you using this? Then why don't you try to start from the scratch? Why don't you create a, uh, an application, custom application from the scratch? And why, why are you using this product at all? Why, why are you paying this license money? And uh, the last item is, it really takes more amount of time to go from a generic solution to a custom solution than customizing a solution from the scratch. Because the underlying framework is adds more complex to the system. So uh, the people who work with SharePoint are similar things now, or at least people work with .NET and Java still experience such things. Sometimes 2 plus 2 doesn't add up to 4, sometimes it's 5, but sometimes it's 6, and you have to dig into uh, articles and Google and Stack Overflow to find why is it, it's happening like that, and then it comes like, ah, if you load this patch, then it will start working again, or ah, did you call this function? Ah, no, it's obsolete, you shouldn't have done that, etc. Things like that make it uh, more harder to uh, make an out-of-the-box solution or generic product to a customized product. And I can tell something about that. The most successful project that I did was another SharePoint uh, Enterprise Content Management solution, which I developed uh, two years before that. And it just had two web parts, one custom counter, and it uh, and just a data migration tool, and uh, they are using it for eight years, I guess. And it hosted uh, different websites of units of this organization, like uh, 600 websites, and they can manage it themselves, and they are still using it. They upgraded the version of SharePoint, but they are still using the same infrastructure that I built, and I'm proud of that, but I didn't do anything special for that. <laughs> So, uh, in the part four, I think uh, I mainly talked about the bad experiences in analysis or design. So, I think the least harmful practices are in development. But most of the time, when we uh, talk about over engineering, we suspect the code. Uh, we blame the code that we write and we say, ah, it, well, it's over engineering. But, but yeah, it's compared to those cases, it's it's very innocent. So, which are the ugly cases? Uh, first thing, I think it happens to many people. You kind of attend to a, a course or about design uh, patterns, or you just read the book of, uh, what was it called? GOF? Can go for, and then uh, you you feel very energetic about energetic about that, that, and you say, yeah, I learned that. But in order to 
completely learn something, you should apply it to somewhere. Then you look for pills to apply them. And what I see usually ends up with is uh, you try to people try to uh, insert all the patterns that they just learned or they are trying patterns in the system. But there is one point in that every pattern comes with uh, a cost and it complicates the solution. So if you use some patterns even for uh, for the sake of just learning it or it sounds cool or it will be good on your CV etc. Then you are all complicating things for nothing and it comes to you with a price of uh, maintenance. And the second item also deals with that, making things too complicated. It doesn't kill your system, it will still work, but it will be much harder to maintain. Maybe there will be some urgent, deadly issues, bugs in the system on live production and it will be very hard for you to solve. But if you keep things as simple as possible, or let's say if, if you don't apply something new, if it's uh, really, really, really needed, then it's it's much easier to uh, see what is happening in the system and how to recover it. Uh, the third item is uh, keeping legacy components for too long, and this is the kind of opposite of that. Sometimes you say, oh, okay, the system is running. The system is running, and I have some components which are older, and okay, it doesn't work. I'm, I'm keeping it. And you keep it, keep it, and the components that you use in time start to be legacy. And uh, then the company behind it stops supporting it, or let's say it was an open source project, and the people just go ahead, they, they just quit the project, and it stays there with the old code. And then uh, what will you do if something happens? Then uh, you're using a component which was, uh, which ended of its support period like five years ago and you have an issue with that and then your managers come to you how can we solve it and then you say yeah usually what happens is technically impossible <laughs> there's an answer like that <laughs> and yeah but we do it ourselves but we should we should do the extra step in somewhere okay I'm, I'm against the thing like here is the new uh, product, new framework, new component, let's use it as soon as possible. Yeah, uh, you should do the calculation about uh, what are the pros, what are the cons, and what will I win, and how much uh, money or time will I use. But please don't keep your components too out of date, then you are in uh, trouble and it will be harder to do it afterwards. So I consider this uh, good, or at least not harmful. Uh, so I think it's a good practice to leave the code that you that you touch in a better state that you found, it, or at least as how it was. But there are times, as we do, as we maintain the code, we see some crappy code, and we say, okay. It won't be the one to touch it, and some other developer says that, some other developer says that, and it just stays there. And uh, it's really, it's kind of telling a story. This uh, reminds me uh, of an experience that I had. Uh, let's say we had such a code which tells a story of life, and then I was handing it over to another developer, and he was asking, oh, why did you add that? Uh, because uh, this guy wanted it, uh, so why is it there? Ah, there was a bug, so we added this if statement. Oh, but, but why is it for loop and it's not doing it? Uh, but there was another bug that we had to do it. So the code then starts to tell a story of life. Okay, uh, this day I did this, this guy wanted that, this guy wanted that. And then it's, it's not a complete solution. One looks at the code and he doesn't understand anything from it. And second item, uh, I think it's a good practice to make your code as testable 
as uh, possible in the given amount of time, even if it's for a demo or proof of concept. Once we, uh, with our colleagues, had an uh, experience in my previous project, uh, the project managers came to us and said, oh, hey, come on, we will do a demo to the customer <laughs> and we should get these things ready, like they are running, exactly uh, as they are running. And so we did, the, uh, we developed things, but we did that as barely running in the happiest path possible. Then they went to the demo, and we were proud of ourselves that we delivered a good system for the demo. And we said, uh, how was the demo? And they said, good, it was pretty good. But now the customer thinks that we actually have these features. So we have to develop them as soon as possible. So this is when your demo code and your uh, crappy code that you just developed for the sake of running becomes your production code immediately. So considering that, I think it's a good practice to make it as generic as possible in the given amount of time. Maybe you can do like for, the, for doing a demo system, you, you will spend two days. Just spend five days, no one will die, I think. It's, it will still be acceptable for those people. But if, if it's more generic, if it's more testable, you can still continue working on that code. But if it's something like a Hello World project, then you, you have to either uh, start from scratch, which is uh, not very usual. Um, what happens usually is you continue working on the crappy code and then things start falling down in time because you, you didn't, at the beginning, you didn't uh, design it for something like that. Okay, that's all. So uh, are there questions for the years? They are waiting for you and cut it. Or experiences to share? Hey, come on. <laughs> Do, you've been living here for a year now. Do you yeah. find that the, the cultural differences between uh, the Netherlands and Turkey also show up in, in, in cases like this, where people overcomplicate things? Uh, in fact, there are some different things. Uh, in Turkey, I was working on fixed time and fixed price contracts, and mostly in the government sector. And here I'm working on a product-based company. But still, let's say, for refactoring. <coughs> I have other kinds of examples. Let's say mm -hmm. one colleague comes to me and say, hey, I, I want to refactor this. But then this refactoring can turn into writing the code from the scratch. And <laughs> the refactoring takes like one month. And then, oh, OK, at least it's better. Then they found out another like, project group, and they say, oh, okay, we will start with refactoring this code. Well, come on, it was just refactored like two months ago. And then they start, oh, we are doing hard refactoring this time. And then they, they again, <laughs> do, write the code from the scratch, and then it's called refactoring. And yeah, okay, I said refactoring is good, but not that type of refactoring. So I'm now having those kind of differences, but I didn't have the chance to work in the same field. So that's why I'm asking you if, uh, if, if it feels familiar or if it's like something from the Mars or like, <laughs> yeah, with fear or something. Uh, Great, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my experience with uh, like a lot of uh, small companies is that they are always budget based. Like, okay, you have this amount of time and yeah. you can spend spend this and this. And what I've learned actually from those things is that you have need to give them like multiple solutions. Like, okay, one is like okay long term, or one is like mid term or short term. So I think that's also like a good. In that you'd have to in mind, okay, sometimes customer does want a long-term solution because maybe they think like, oh, maybe this project won't last for a year. So you just give them a short-term solution that they keep continue and have like uh, getting money from their investment actually. And, and that's, I think like, yeah, uh, for like a big company, probably you, you go for the long-term solution 
and for small companies like yeah okay they just want to have a solution now right now so you just give them like multiple things to think about and then keep on uh, doing that actually yeah you, you mean you mean the uh, companies as the customers or the yeah, customers? Yeah, customer indeed, yeah. 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 yeah, I definitely agree. I think one of the keys is having uh, an active conversation with the customer. So uh, then you can tell yourself and they can tell. And you can say, okay, this will take this amount of time, but it's very basic. And this will take this amount of time, but it will... Uh, you can benefit it in the like, longer term and this will be uh, the best solution for it but it will take this amount of time and money and I think they will understand but probably it's not a silver bullet no, uh, we, no. yeah we say but it I think it improves things yeah always discuss with the customer yeah. always say like hey, these are the options just choose one and then we do it for you that's uh, yeah. what I've learned actually I definitely agree which one I actually find it hard to uh, scale myself back when dealing with situations like that. Like this is stuff you do in the long term. Has to, uh, it's better, better structured, blah blah blah. But we don't really need it in the short term, so we're not doing it. And while you're programming, you're like, I really should do this better. And um, uh, like, if you don't, if you don't put <coughs> yourself in the hand, you might be actually doing it the right way, but uh, taking about five times as long. So that's something I'm struggling with a lot, actually. And I think there's always like determination, like, okay, the customer, you, you have decided to go this path, so stick to it. Yeah, I think that's uh, from yourself. I think that you have to keep on that doing that, and because you know in a way that is actually wrong, maybe, but you have said to the customer, okay, we do this, and this is the amount of time you're gonna do it, and then you just deliver that, even if it's wrong, actually, because sometimes you cannot say like, okay, yeah, just spend this X amount of money to do this, and and they are like maybe like waiting like for a month for the feature, and they say like, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. Yeah, that's what I've learned with those actually small companies. Uh, in, so. Yeah, and sometimes when, when you go with, without interaction with the customer or when not applying <coughs> agile, or <laughs> there are different stories of agile <laughs> applications. Oh, everyone says that they are doing agile, but yeah, it, it's another story. It's their own version. But sometimes they they have some specification on paper and you do it exactly like that and then when you show it to themselves and they say ah this is not what i want or this this is not what i need so this is where this communication comes and i think this is one of the principles of those agi and scrum and so, so can I ask a question, how would you deal with uh, over engineering as like a contingency plan where you're building systems to make sure your systems don't fail? Uh, so, so how do you determine, am I over engineering or am I just doing best practices? Well, uh, in, in development I, I think there is a very thin line and sometimes Thinking about it might be like overthinking. <laughs> or oh, am I doing over engineering now? What am I doing? And sometimes code reviews can uh, go something like that. Oh, why did you do that? Why did you name this variable like that? <laughs> this is that. Uh, yeah, but I, in my opinion, the over engineering which is done in development is not that deadly. Okay. But it happens in the design or even analysis of the project, then then you are doomed. Then, then it's pretty hard to recover that. And if if you don't tell the customer or inside customers, users of the system, hey, did, did, we are we are not going in the correct direction. And uh, they they just assume uh, everything will be okay someday. <laughs> they are expecting that then they are surprised with the end product. So. I think uh, the practices in development in uh, what we do are, yeah, it, they can be recoverable. If it's even if it's over engineering, okay, it doesn't hurt the project. Maybe it took like one month instead of one week to develop it, but it still works. 
<laughs> but the other case can fill the whole project and prevent the customer from using this, this is my opinion. Which beer? You can take. Oh, I will also like to share a, a small story. Okay. So, so yeah. I'm a front end developer, and at my previous employment, uh, we basically were building a platform where open hardware developers, like, like product designers, could share their ideas and share them in a sort of a wiki sort of in thing. But uh, we were building uh, uh, an editor where people could edit their text and add images, stuff like that. And it was a really complicated editor. And uh, the people that did know how to use it would produce really ugly content. It was like really awful to look at. And they were usually designers, so they were also upset that they couldn't make beautiful things with it. But uh, in the end, the only person who actually knew how to use it was one of our interns. <laughs> <laughs> and that guy ended up making all the pages for, for all the designers who wanted to use our platform. So that sort of took up so, all So you started delivering the content. Yeah, the exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also another good business model, maybe. For <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe they make more money than that. Maybe with machine money. I, I, I have a question. Did the users... <coughs> Compared this with other editors, ah, in this editor I was I was able to do that, but not in yours. Yeah, yeah, obviously, and, and one of the main examples always was like in Facebook or Twitter. I can just I have like <laughs> this one field I can just. Yeah. Put well, now you are competing with Facebook. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's always Facebook, <laughs> but they have a, a UI where you can just put your pictures in there and it looks good, and you have a nice boxed a contained piece of content on the timeline. And that's basically what we should have built, but we built like a, a sort of word like thing <laughs> where, where you could center a line and left a line oh. and a right a line and move your images and slide them around and it would become very And they were still not happy, right? No, because <laughs> it took a lot of time to, to make stuff look good. <laughs> yeah. And they didn't even want to spend a lot of time. They just wanted to get their ideas out there in a beautiful way. Yeah, yeah very good. Thank you very much. Anyone else? One last beer? No one is interested? Okay. Thank you very much for listening and uh, participating. And it was really... Uh, I'm doing this session for the third time, but it was the best. <laughs> <laughs>